Well, before we start, do you have any questions for me? Well, we're just looking forward to hear your fascinating stories. I, I think that will be, you know. Uh, so are you doing some more recent uh, public speech or we can follow you on PBS? Uh. <laughs> well, I, well, interestingly enough, yes. Yeah. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with the folks who um, brought you Drain the Oceans. I don't know if you've seen those ser the series Drain the Oceans, which is primarily on National Geographic. Mm. Doesn't ring a bell? These are um, programs where they investigate uh, wrecks that uh, have historical significance and using sonar imagery, photography, and computer graphics, they, you know, virtually drain the ocean so you can look at the wreck of the Titanic, the wreck of Bismarck, the wreck of, na mm -hmm. name your, you know, name your favorite ship, and a lot of other um, things as well. One of their more recent episodes was J Dra Drain the South China Sea, which was fascinating because it uncovered the, the myriad of undersea cables, fiber optic cables, which connect the world. And each one of these shows the, the uh, places a backstory. So I've been just filming a number of um, episodes having to do with the recent discovery of the uh, battleship Nevada, um, forensic science on the battles of the Dardanelles. That's the, um, those were the, uh, uh, the battles that took place just before Gallipoli during the First World War, um, Second World War, um, you name it. And then I've been uh, also working on a couple of book projects, um, one of which is uh, on the uh, cooperation between the United States and Britain during the Second World War. Um, what most people know is that uh, the United States built um, liberty ships, as they say, they, they they built them by the mile and cut them by the yard. You guys have all heard that phrase, right? The Liberty ships that were built in, yes. you know, four or five days. What most people don't know is Liberty ships were British. Um, the British needed them. They brought their plans over. We looked at them and said, yeah, we can build them. Um, they gave it to Henry Kaiser, who was famous for building the Grand Coulee Dam. Um, one of his workmen who, you know, spent his life on civil projects looked at, you know, look, looked at the whole thing and said, okay, when do we pour the keel? Um, yes, that really happened. Uh, the landing ship tank, the LST, that was the critical vessel for the Normandy landings, as well as many of the operations in the Pacific. And the LST, of course, was an amphibious ship that brought tanks that could land them straight on the beach. British. Um, British brought their requirements over. Um, we worked on the engineering and design and we built it um, with their help. So an, an incredible amount of what happened in that juncture of the Second World War really was um, a, a combination of the Americans and the British working together. And I think if there's one theme that goes through all of my books, everything that I write and almost everything I do, it's that international cooperation um, beats uh, individualism every time, every day, twice on Sundays. So everything that you see in these books, you know, there's no one nation that has ever uh, laid claim to uh, knowledge that uh, is, is unique. It's, it's always spread and, and it's always been shared. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's my soapbox. I was waiting to see if the number of uh, participants is uh, is increasing. So I don't know at what point you'd like to start, but uh, my my plan is not to, you know, be too much in in the way of soapbox and really focus on naval architecture. And I'm going to start off with a question, by the way. So I hope people have access to their microphones because I will be asking a question of the faculty and of the students. All right. Well, we maybe we start. Uh, I mean, we got uh, more participants now. 
So should we start now? It's five minutes after the, uh, the plant starting time. Okay, great. So hello everyone. Thank you all for attending this uh, name community project. Uh, I'm glad to kick off the event for the semester. Uh, during this pandemic, more than ever, we need to keep the sense of community and support each other. So thanks to the hard work of our staff members and uh, the enthusiastic support of our, our alumni and friends, we have a great series of events with distinguished speakers lined up this semester. Well, I'm sorry that we won't be able to provide lunch as we did in the past, uh, and I hope we can make it up later on. Uh, but I'm sure that you will get plenty of food for thought from those events. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce the speaker today for our first event in this special semester, Dr. Larry Ferraro. So after 17 years working in this department, I know and have met many naval architects, but Larry is the only naval architect that I know with a PhD degree in history and is a Pulitzer Prize finalist. I understand that he is the first naval architect to be a Pulitzer Prize finalist. And he is our 1980 class graduate. So you can see from his bio that he had a very special and incredible career. And he regularly appears on documentaries on BBC, National Geographic, and Discover channels. So without further ado, I will let Larry tell you the fascinating stories. Larry, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. So um, the title of um, this uh, two uh, book talk over these two books, as you can see, is uh, the story of naval architecture, four centuries in search of the ideal hull form. It is taking longer than we thought. Um, the two books that um, you see here are the very first histories of naval architecture. Um, the first book, Ships and Science, takes us from the year 1600 to 1800 during the age of sail and the scientific revolution. And the second book brings us more or less to the present day um, and the, um, in the industrial age. And I will, um, this is the agenda for today, but before we begin, I'm, uh, I want to ask everyone here um, a question. This is for both the students and faculty. Um, and if you can open your mic, because I, I, it's a little hard to go to the chat room. Um, and if somebody does go to the chat room, maybe somebody else can read what they say. I'm asking everybody here if they can uh, to please name a naval architect um, who um, has some uh, historical uh, significance apart from William Froude, um, who they, they know the name. And, and this does not count people that you know personally. So again, name a naval architect of some fame or renown apart from William Froude um, and, and aside from people who you know personally, and it can be from any period in history. So yeah, could you just, count like Archimedes or someone like that? Um, if he, it, well, yes, that's good. He wasn't a naval architect, but he certainly had an influence on the develop of naval, on the development of naval architecture by first describing the principles of buoyancy. So I mean, excellent. Didn't he build the Syracuse though? Isn't that at least one ship? Or no, he didn't like... build it. Um, he, he was uh, he was not the prote. Um, no, sorry, that's Venetian. He was not the builder. The legend is that he developed a device that helped to launch the Syracuse, which was a massive cargo slash warship. But there's no indication he actually uh, designed and built it. But but the fact that you knew about Archimedes is, is important, and the fact that you knew about the Syracuse was even more important. Some, some others. How about William Francis Gibbs? 
Very good. Um, he was the icon of the uh, construction of much of uh, the Navy in, in World War II. Gibbs and Cox was the go-to firm for the U.S. Navy for most of the plans for destroyers, frigates, um, landing ships, um, etc. And of course, uh, William Francis Gibbs himself uh, became famous for building the uh, SS United States, which was uh, still the fastest passenger liner, full-blown passenger liner to cross the Atlantic. Um, never did get a degree in naval architecture, which is the most interesting thing. Um, his degree was in political science, but he, uh, he was a fast learner. So, okay, I'm glad somebody, okay, I'm glad Gibbs. Uh, one or two more. Larry, this is Armin. Let me throw this out. Uh, what about Benjamin Franklin? Franklin's role in uh, naval architecture um, was two parts. The first is that he was the first to describe the Gulf Stream, which had an influence on the way ships navigated. But he carried out a very small scale experiment that um, confirmed that uh, ships in shallow water have uh, higher resistance than ships in deeper water. And uh, it was, you know, very, it was literally a tabletop experiment where he put a little basin of water. He had a weight attached to some coins that towed the small model, varied the depth and counted. He didn't even, even have a clock. He counted time by doing, by doing this on his, uh, on his fingers. Dum, 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 dum. So um, that was his influence um, on, on, uh, naval architecture, uh, for mechanical, for marine engineering, he believed, uh, Bernoulli's claim that water jets were better than propellers. And he influenced a, uh, a generation of boat builders to try to develop a pump jet instead of a pro propellers or even paddle wheels, which turned out to be a, 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 a dead end. So Armin, did that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, any others before I continue? Because that, there's a reason I'm asking. David Taylor. And excellent. So David Taylor, of course, was the naval constructor who um, really pushed American naval architecture forward by uh, huge degrees. He was a uh, trained in Britain. Um, as a naval constructor, uh, became quite well known for his uh, uh, model series. He also uh, introduced in the American, on the American side of the, uh, uh, this side of the pond, the application of naval architecture to uh, aircraft. If you've ever wondered why airplanes have port and starboard, and you ever wonder why airplanes have uh, a wetted surface, um, and they pitch and yaw and roll, it's because naval architects were the first ones to design aircraft. So if he's, his name was given over to the model basin, which I'll talk about later. The reason I'm asking everybody about this is there are very few naval architects, and I'm glad you were able to name uh, them, who have risen to um, popular um, knowledge, you know, people don't know the names off the top of their head the way they know civilian or civil archi uh, architects like Frank Lloyd Wright or, uh, Ga you know, Frank Gehry. Um, part of the reason I wrote these books, and I say this in my introduction to the first one, is that um, for all of my time at Michigan, to be honest, I only heard the name William Froude, but I didn't know who he was or uh, really why he did what he did. So part of the reason I wrote um, this history of naval architecture was to bring out of these um, shadows the names and importance of the people who created our discipline. And I've given us a story for the very first time. Um, so this particular lecture you can see uh, is only going to be covering a very small part of that whole, um, that whole story. Now, naval architecture is not ship design, and this is important, and I know that many of you know this, but it, this is still worth repeating, that ship design is, in fact, a very complex 
process, which involves design itself, it involves program management, it involves computers, and these are the areas that are typically covered in the um, these boxes by uh, naval architecture itself. So when we talk about ship design, we're not talking about naval architecture and vice versa. Now, most of this lecture is about um, this, and, and um, can I assume that you can see my arrow? Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. That's why I'm asking. Yes, we can see it. So I'm primarily focused on this, but across the two books that I've written, I'm actually talking about all of these. So let's first talk about what naval architecture is. As you can see, uh, Inigo Montoya famously said about naval architecture, you keep using that word. I don't think that word means what you think it means. And this definition, which I've developed, differentiates naval architecture from ship design, and more importantly, it puts it in context. So if we want to talk about ship design, the big picture, it's about creating the ship from concept to fabrication, everything from the idea of the ship all the way to the building and launching and putting it into the water. But the theory, which is the things that are occupying um, all of us uh, late at night when we're students doing the calculus and doing the calculations, is really the science that describes um, how and why ships do what they do, either based on um, mathematical formula or empirically de derived data. Uh, I, I remember working with steam tables um, and that's the theory, but there has to be a link between the design of the ship and the theory and that's naval architecture. And naval architecture is about engineering. Now you can see that the words technology, science and engineering are all part of STEM. Um, well, this is how they all relate. Naval architecture is a very specific branch of engineering and engineering is all about prediction. Ever since people first started thinking about uh, putting uh, two sticks of wood together or um, several sticks of wood to make a bridge, figuring out how it worked and how much it can carry was always part of the process. Naval architecture is specifically the means of using ship theory as part of ship design to predict what the ship is going to do, how it's going to operate before it's built. And that is the best way to describe what naval architecture as a discipline does. Now, it, um, it didn't always start with a predictive formula. Um, in the earliest of days, many of the shipwrights of the time, and this is Matthew Baker's famous drawing of the cod's head and mackerel's tail, tried to um, explain using uh, natural forms like fish, why ships look the way they did. Now, this did not mean that shipwrights actually went out, caught fish, measured them, and then um, created ship hulls based upon the ship form. What they were trying to do is explain why ships look the way they did, which was over many years of practice by referring to natural objects. This was great if you're trying to explain to your patron because what you're trying to do is prove that you're worth the money that people are paying you, um, uh, that there is a basis for the um, shipbuilding, but it's not an attempt to actually predict in the way we would think of today, uh, the performance of the ship. That capability didn't really begin until Isaac Newton came on the scene. Um, by the way, is the entire, sorry, but I should ask if the entire screen is visible or if there's any um, parts that are not visible. Seems like we can see everything. Yeah, we Great. Can see everything. Yeah, again, I, I have different, depending upon which version of Zoom I'm using, I get different results. Isaac Newton, uh, uh, Principia Mathematica, which uh, was published just um, at the uh, end of the 1600s, was a, a, his attempt to apply mathematical principles to all, mean, all, um, all forms of physical phenomenon, um, light, light, the orbits of the planets, etc. And one of the things that Newton was, was interested in was hydrodynamics. He actually started much of what we would call today 
hydrodynamics. And his idea was that there were small particles, water, which would impinge on the front of a vessel, the bow. And by calculating how those particles bounced off, you'd be able to figure out the resistance of the ship. Now, obviously it, took in, it did not take into account this whole aft portion of the ship, but that was the basis for the very earliest attempts at modeling um, hydrodynamic resistance. And because of the way his calculus worked, his idea for this I solid of least resistance, that was his term, was that um, a bow that was more or less flat would have the least resistance of any type of hull. This was called a bow shock theory. And the idea fell upon the mathematical world um, without any real understanding of what to do with it or how to employ it in ship design. And that changed in 1746 when Pierre Bouguer, who was a French hydrodynamic, who really was a French hydrographer, um, wrote the very first book of naval architecture that we would consider a modern uh, book, and that's called Traité du Navire, and a treatise of the ship. Now, this is the very first book of naval architecture in which he defines for the first time elements of stability. He's the one who came up with the idea and named it uh, the Metacenter. He developed the ideas of maneuvering, of uh, sail, of sea keeping, um, ship strength. And um, he wrote all of this, or most of it, by the way, while he was in, on an expedition high in the Andes of Peru, um, literally on the mountains uh, of the Andes, um, penning this book uh, as far, about as far away from the ocean as you can imagine. And that's a great story. One of the things that he developed was this idea of taking Newton's bow shock and applying it to a ship by dividing up the bow of the ship into these planar elements. Yes, this was a finite element analysis in the year 1746. And by calculating the shock on each one of these elements and then integrating over the entire bow of the ship, you could get the um, ratio of bow resistance. Now, the difference was uh, between uh, what we would call prediction today and this is that this was more uh, comparative. This, this gave you numbers that you could compare with other ships. It really didn't translate directly into speed and knots or anything like that, but this was the very first attempt to try to apply mathematical and physical principles to hydrodynamics. Now, people did not um, take this necessarily at face value. And not that long after Bouguer's book was published and scientists and, and, and shipwrights began using it, other scientists under the aegis of um, different scientific programs, which were very important at the time, began to re-examine the question of hydrodynamics using solid, using models, small scale models. Um, this was done by Bosu, who was a civil engineer. And well, he was a scientist and engineer that uh, the, the two really weren't differentiated very well at the time. Um, in Paris, um, using a scale model, this was under the aegis of the Paris Academy of Sciences. Um, Beaufoy, who was a civil engineer, um, did his model experiments at the Greenwich Dock in London under the aegis of what was called the Society for the Improvement of Naval Architecture. And you can see that the apparatuses are very similar. There's a tall tower with weights that pull a model connected by a string through the water, and then they time it to see which, um, by comparing different hull forms, they could prove that, you know, what the, uh, uh, what, which hull worked best, but they could also determine whether the theories that um, Bouguer and Newton had developed were in fact correct, and they showed that they were not correct. The problem was there was nothing to take its place. And so naval architects continued to use these theories for many years. It wasn't until John Scott Russell came onto the scene in the 1830s that the idea of hydrodynamics began to change. Now, Russell was a civil engineer, he was a shipbuilder, and he was also mathematically trained, which was unusual for the time. Um, so uh, he was British. And uh, one of the things that he took from his reading of Newton and Bouguer 
was that there probably was this solid of least resistance, but it didn't look the way Newton uh, said. He thought that because there was this new science of waves, um, which was just coming to the fore in the 1820s and 1830s, that any vessel that is shaped like one of the waves it's passing through is going to have zero wave resistance. That was his idea. If the wave of translation, that's basically what a, um, uh, what a, a wave uh, generated by a body moving through the water, um, if the hull was shaped like that, it shouldn't generate any resistance. So his concept was build the ship so that it has this hollow bow, which is a sine curve essentially, and then it would come up and then have a cycloidal afterbody. He argued that this should look like ocean waves. And his, his theory was if you built a ship that had this sine wave in the front and a cycloid in the back, there would be zero wave resistance. It would be the perfect body. Now, just to stop anybody who's going to start investigating whether you can do this in real life, mathematics have, have come a long way since then. And neither Newton's idea nor John Scott Russell's idea that there is a perfect body of least, least resistance exists. There's no mathematically provable minimum resistance hull form, period. So um, that means we still, as naval architects, have a lot of work to do. We're still in search of that ideal hull form. So this was a great idea. 1830s, there wasn't anything else around. And John Scott Russell, um, as I said, was a shipbuilder. So he was able to take his ideas and apply it to actual ships being built, including Great Eastern. Now, Great Eastern was the brainchild of this man, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And he's a name you all should know. And I'll tell you, uh, you'll, you'll see especially why in a, in a couple, in a minute or two, but Brunel was the icon of engineering in the Victorian age. He created the bridges, the railroads, not just in Britain, but across much of Europe. Um, most of the projects that he built turned out to be money losers, but he pushed the edges and knowledge of engineering further than anybody else could. Brunel came up with this idea of a giant ship. This was the largest ship of the 1800s, um, displacing over 26,000 tons that would be able to sail all the way to Australia and back. And it turned out to be a fiasco, like every other Brunel project, but it really pushed the boundaries of naval architecture because it brought into one place the ideas of this wave line hull form, which it was built into, the idea of the ship as a structural girder co comparable to an actual iron bridge, which the um, Great Eastern was built to. Um, he brought into this one vessel many of the ideas that, a mo that we would recognize as modern. This vessel and its launch was really the birth of modern naval architecture. And for much of the 1800s, the idea of the waveline hull form dominated naval architecture. It was the basis for the clipper ship. This is the flying, this is flying cloud. Um, which was ba based, as you can see from this drawing, um, this is a perfect wave line, and this is the actual water line of Flying Cloud. It was as close to the wave line theoretical hull form as you could get, and many clipper ships were built with these, um, these kinds of um, uh, sine wave or concave bows. This yacht, very famous, the Yacht America, was built to a perfect wave line hull form. The man who developed the clipper ship knew the man who built the yacht America. Um, Griffiths was his name, John W. Griffiths, another name of a naval architect who's worth knowing, that um, he knew about the wave line. He studied the works of John Scott Russell. He applied the wave line theory to his clipper ships. And he told George Steers, who built Yacht America, about the wave line, who then built, and this was the fastest um, uh, yacht in the uh, 1851 
what became the America's Cup. So wave lines dominated um, sailing ships, yachts, and even transatlantic steamers for many years until William Froude came on the scene. Now this is the name you all know, but you probably didn't know that he was uh, uh, Isambard, was, uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's civil engineer on the Torquay Rail Project. That's where he made his bones. And he worked for many years on the railroads. Um, it was only when Brunel um, was getting um, uh, antsy about the launch of Great Eastern because he really didn't know how the ship was going to react when it was launched and how it would react once it was in the water. He asked Froude to carry out the calculations for him. Froude did. He also made some scale models of the uh, vessel and tested it in the pool in his house, um, which is now, which was a hotel. When I stayed there, I even swam in that William Froude's pool. Um, they're now apartments, so you can't use the pool anymore. Um, and based upon that experience, he developed this idea of testing that wave line theory using scale models. He built one model, Raven, to the wave line hull form. He built another uh, model, Swan. You can see them here in the um, uh, Science Museum. And he noticed that when he built different size models that the um, resistance of each one and the way it made waves scaled according to the size of the model in a ratio that he could predict. So he came up with the idea of using scale models as a way of predicting not movement, but of um, hydrodynamic resistance. And so this is what um, Froude made the case to the British Admiralty. He said, you don't need to build full scale ships and test them. You can build small models, test them, and you can get a pretty good approximation of how much power you're going to need. And that's gonna save you a lot of money. And that's why the Admiralty said, goest thou and build your, tust, your, your towing tank, because we're gonna save money on building ships and we're gonna save money on coal. So the first thing Froude did was take a, an old clapped out um, vessel, took everything off of it that was Greyhound, towed it behind a, a steamship, um, measured the resistance and then towed a scale model of it in his towing tank. And then he plotted one on top of the other. It's a little hard to see because the two lines overlap. This, the line, um, uh, line C is the actual resistance uh, and line B is the scaled, is the resistance of the model scaled up. And by this, he was able to prove that you could use scale models to predict um, large scale um, uh, behavior. And this of course became not just the basis for naval architecture, aerodynamics is based on scale models. So structural engineering, so is astronautics, so is almost every major um, branch of engineering we have today uses scale models in one form or another and they all had their origins in William Froude. Now William Froude's tank in Torquay, which is in the south of Britain, was this. It was about 300 feet long, um, dug uh, straight out of the ground. And it only lasted about nine years before this was just too small to um, make a difference uh, for what the British Admiralty was looking for. So they built the tank in Hasler, which is outside of Portsmouth in 1886, which gave rise to all of the other towing tanks that we know today. In fact, um, water from the Hasler tank is often used to christen other tanks when they open. This, of course, is our tank and uh, opened in 1904. And this is David Taylor's tank. Um, during the Second World War, it was run by these women. Um, they, they all have names. Um, so I'm, uh, and they're, they're in my book. Um, so I'm not going to find something that sounds like Rosie the Riveter, but for the, uh, uh, the, the, the tank engineers. But um, this was all the legacy of William Froude. Now, that's how we did work for a very long time. In fact, um, if you ask some of your oldest uh, professors, um, they will probably be able to tell you stories about having everybody together in this huge drafting room. And oh, by the way, we had one of these in West Engineering, um, you know, where people were leaning over and getting their elbows uh, full of uh, um, 
either ink or, or pencil. These were the kinds of ship's curves that we use. Now these are pear wood curves from the uh, 1930s. This is thanks to the, um, your, your sister um, uh, school in Madrid, um, Edson, um, one of the naval architects there, a friend of mine sent me the picture of his set, which he got from uh, one of his professors from the 1930s. This was also his uh, Amstler integrator. Um, these were the tools that we all, you know, people of a certain age, me, um, <laughs> knew and loved and grew up with. And that's what a computer looked like. Um, this was uh, probably about as powerful as not your cell phone, as powerful as your um, car key fob. Your car key fob has about as much computing power as this. And of course, computers got better. By the time um, I was working regularly um, on ship designs for the Navy doing um, DDG-51 and LPD-17 and so on, we had a pretty good suite of systems. Uh, everybody was working on these workstations. They were big clunky things, probably as powerful as your television control, um, but certainly not as powerful as your cell phone because your cell phone is a supercomputer. If you didn't know that, it's about as powerful as a Cray from the 1980s. We could do hydrostatics. We could do 2D synthesis models. We even had some pretty good 2D hull fairing. So we were still using paper. A lot of these things that you see here were printed out and we worked on them on the desks. Um, we still had those drafting tables where we put computers on top of them. <laughs> so um, that's how we worked. And fast forward to um, today, and this is what ship design looks like. It's decentralized. Those big workspaces, either with drafting tables or with workstations, have been replaced by people working well. Many of you will recognize this. This came out of Nautilus magazine. Um, and very often they're working in many different locations around the world. Um, we've gone from uh, solid models to 2D drawings and back to solid models. Um, solid models from the you know, year 1600 uh, to 2D drawings, and now we're back to solid models, but on computers. And of course, we're using um, three-dimensional computational fluid dynamics. So naval architecture has come a long ways in 400 years, but the purpose has not changed. It's still for predicting the characteristics and performance of the ship. That's how it began. That's what it's for today. And even though a finite element analysis of a ship's bow looks different in the year 1746 than it does in the year 2020, in part because the mesh is a little bit finer, the reasons we, we use these tools have not changed. Thank you. Now I tried to leave. Wow. Thank you I so tried much. to leave plenty of room for questions, so um, and I don't know what the clock looks like. So um, yeah, we we do have time for questions. Um, so thank you so much, Larry, for that uh, great great talk. Uh, I learned a lot from uh, this uh, forty five minutes. Uh, yeah, this this uh, lecture will be recorded. It's recorded. Uh, will be made available. Uh, to other students. Who... Closer to 30 yeah. minutes, actually. Especially from the students. I'm yeah. really interested to hear from the students. Please speak up. Take the podium. And if somebody's using the chat room, uh, it's hard for me to see it. So if there is a chat question, if someone else can read it out, I'd be uh, grateful. Yeah, I'm taking a look at that. We haven't seen the question in the chat room yet. So at the end there, you said um, it started 3D and then went 2D, like you were talking about with the giant drafting tables and then back to 3D modeling now. Do you think it will ever shift back to 2D again or just the ability to make a 3D model in you know, not a lot of time is just too invaluable or or is there some approximation of that with computers now? Well, I was just kind of wondering well, what your thoughts are. Well, the slight joke there was um, back in the days of the shipwrights, they didn't make drawings. They just built the ships. 
So it was a 3D model. And then they started to use drawings. And for like 500 years, they were using drawings as part of the design. And now we're back to 3D modeling, but using computers. So that that's the, the joke was a little bit flat. So now I know the next time I, I get up, I'm going to have to um, uh, preface it by saying, we weren't really using drawings. We were using, we were just building at full scale. And by the way, um, those ships that you see in the early days, including the one you're looking at right now, many naval architects did not even bother to use plans. They knew just from their, their own experience exactly how to build it. They did not need to reference anything on paper. If you think about the cathedral builders of the uh, medieval times, it was pretty much the same way. There were no drawn plans. This came out of their heads. They knew the measurements. They knew how everything linked up. These incredibly complex ships, many of them for many years, were built without re referring to a piece of paper. It was all literally right here. So was that Brian? Yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, thanks. That's good to did know. Did that answer your question? Yes, I'm. I'm sorry, I did not get the joke initially. No, and that's I, because I, I said now. that's because I set it up badly. You know, I'm, I, and and that's why Jerry Seinfeld usually gets up and, uh, you know, runs through his jokes a few times. Uh, you know, in in the comedy clubs before he goes on stage. Fair enough. <laughs> thank you. And by the way, thank you for that lead-in because I do have a a set of questions that uh, I'm wondering if anybody's going to ask. And if they don't ask them, I will, and then I'll answer them. Uh, hey, Larry. So I was wondering, how close do you think we are to designing the perfect hull shape in terms of minimizing resistance? Um, the, the answer is as far away now as we were 400 years ago. Uh, the simple answer is you can't. Um, there's never been, it's, it's A, mathematically impossible. Um, and there are proofs for that, by the way. If you are really interested, I give, a, uh, I give the reference in my first book. And B, uh, the perfect uh, is always about uh, what you're trying to do with the ship in the first place. So just to take this example, this is a lumber schooner. And its job is to carry as much lumber over a long distance um, as uh, efficiently as possible. And that would be very different from uh, another ship which might have to operate, say, carrying passengers or tea from uh, Asia to uh, the Americas. That's why clipper ships look the way they did. Their cargo was generally passengers, which is very light, uh, and uh, tea, which is also very light, but both are products that you don't want to be at sea for long periods of time. So clipper ships look much different than this, this lumber schooner. So um, the, the slight, the tongue in cheek uh, comment at the very beginning of this 400 years in search of the whole perfect hull form, ideal hull form is taking longer than we thought um, really is a reference to the fact that uh, there's never been and can't be an ideal hull form. Having said that, a lot of what we do as naval architects is figure out the right balance between a ship that's fast, a ship that's stable, a ship that's safe, a ship that's economical. So did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. So Larry, there's a question from the chat room here from uh, Charles, uh, who cannot turn on uh, his uh, mic. Uh, so the question is, how would you say the change from wooden ships to iron steel affected the possible shapes ships could take and the ability of naval art to improve hull form? Uh, vastly um, is the in one word. Uh, you, when you are building a ship of wood of any size, here let, let's let's confine it to ocean-going vessels. 
you're rather limited by the wood supply you have, especially the heavier uh, pieces, the frames, which come usually came from the larger trees, especially oak. And because trees only grow in certain shapes, you are rather limited to the kinds of shapes you could put into a hull um, I, to, to, to give naval architects credit by the end of um, the 1900s, they were doing a lot of fascinating work with composite hulls where a combination of iron and wood together was used to create very modern hull forms. But once you went to iron, and then especially when you went to steel, that gave you the ability to uh, curve and change things um, and give you much finer control over the process. What it also did, and I think this is, is critical, doesn't answer your question, but it goes beyond that. It completely changed the nature of shipbuilding. Very few wooden shipbuilders survived the transition to iron. A lot of myth is around the idea that the wooden shipbuilders um, simply threw away their axes and their saws, and they took up iron shipbuilding tools, and nothing could be further from the truth. Iron and then steel ships grew up out of the boiler and locomotive factories that were dominating um, the, the industrial heartlands of nations. They did not grow uh, out of the wooden shipbuilders who by and large either went out of business or saw their business greatly reduced. So the shipwrights were displaced by machine tool workers and um, the cost involved with creating a shipyard went from just having something um, on the shore that you could you know throw together to these large industrial complexes shipyards dockyards became some of the most important industrial facilities in the world for many years they were the most advanced um, industrial sites um, in almost any nation if you look at britain if you look at france if you look at japan um, everywhere the industrial revolution really took hold the advances were in the shipyards so that's all a couple by the way um tell me how much time we have left because i do want to get this two questions i want to ask and i'm i'm free for as long as you need so um you tell me what what the um we've got a couple of questions on the chat room i saw uh, we have about uh, 12 more minutes. Uh, okay. The question, no, uh, I haven't seen question from the, I think there is, uh, they, they, they just say, it's very interesting and thank you. But I have a quick question. So as a historian, and uh, what's your prediction for the future? If you say that, you know, mathematically is impossible to find the, the perfect should we keep trying or should we give up? Thank you for that lead in. Oh, okay. So there's my backup. Um, I was hoping somebody would ask this. And the first question is, um, will computational fluid dynamics replace model basins? This is one of the things that um, in, in, my, in, in, in my career as a, a professional naval architect and then working in the Department of Defense, um, was uh, always at the forefront. Are we going to get away from model basins and solid models and just go to computers? And I don't have an answer for that. But what I do have is the observation that um, the trends are not looking good for the people who keep model basins up and running. Um, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. You can see that the um, number of people in, uh, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics for the next 10 years uh, involved in computers, CAD, and other um, information systems is going to go up at, at about 20% per year. That's, a, that's an annual basis. And that's an enormous rise. Naval architects are doing good. You guys, uh, all your students, you, you, uh, you have a pretty good future in front of you. Um, so not, not to sweat. But the people who keep model basins running, those are the model makers, those are the machinists. Um, 
they, they're largely going away. Um, not rapidly, but if you look at the long-term trends, it may not be that computational fluid dynamics is going to be better than models, which by the way, I, I do not believe that uh, computational fluid dynamics is um, as good in many ways as either full scale or even model scale testing and has a ways to go. We just may be up against the um, uh, occupational stops of having people still being able to keep those model bases up and running uh, at some point in the future. So there's my observation there. What do you mean by occupational stop? If the number of model makers, machinists, and people who uh, are needed to keep these model basins going is decreasing and decreasing at a regular rate, at some point, who's left to actually run the model basin? Who's left to actually make the models? Does that make sense? But what yes, needs? If, if there are needs, then there will be uh, opportunities. So the key question is- I would, I would love to say that. I, 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 I wish that were true, but I think the healthcare industry has showed us that we need um, healthcare workers and just to give one example and filling um, the occupational niches, even when it's needed, um, simply you know, is, is, doesn't happen just because there, there's a need. Um, if employment in these areas are greater, um, more people will gravitate to these than will go to, to this area. I'm not saying that this is going to happen in the next 10 years, but th that's the way the trends are going. So other questions? Um, there was one more um, that I have on this list. Uh, I um, would like to know how many of the students um, have also taken uh, courses or are planning to take courses in systems engineering. Larry, perhaps this is Armin. I could jump in here. Um, could you tell me what you mean by systems engineering? Because the college had a committee of faculty to say, this was a number of years ago, and uh, to see whether we should start a department of systems engineering and to hear the different chairs of the different departments talk about what they thought were systems was was really eye opening. For example, electrical engineering said their idea of systems engineering was whether they could make an iPad. And when we talked about complexity, I thought naval architecture and aerospace engineering were probably the only two that could really claim that we did bona fide complete systems, complex systems engineering? Well, I'm glad you bring this up. Um, the, the short answer for the electrical and computer people and for the aerospace people is that they really do have a 180 degree difference in what they think in, in, what, in systems engineering, which is why making an iPad is so hard. Um, because the people who do the hardware and the people who do the software have two very different ideas. Simply put, um, people involved in software think that um, agile um, acquisition um, and you know, creating software, getting it out to the user, and then improving it um, is systems engineering. And hardware, people believe in uh, developing prototypes until the requirements are set and then building off the prototype. So the reason why systems engineering um, is somewhat different than the traditional ship design and development is here. And uh, for those of you who have not taken systems engineering, um, and you will be introduced to it, if not in the school, when you get into your career, you will see this, um, is the idea that you start, um, start with the, so most of us are familiar with the ship design spiral. 
Um, this is the idea that you start with your uh, uh, general arrangements and you work through these calculations and then you come to the first spiral and you find out that um, everything you calculated doesn't quite match what you started with and so you do a second spiral all the way until you come up with a completed design. The uh, systems engineering, which you will see um, is typified in aerospace, um, starts with this idea of um, a concept of operations and develops requirements uh, which are then um, uh, what's called allocated. So uh, at each point, it sort of looks like this design spiral, but if you can think of this design spiral as taking place in every one of these steps, and in every one of these steps, you're also building the prototype of the system that you're developing until you're certain that the requirements are meeting what the system itself look like until you actually have all the way, come all the way down to the point where you're ready to start manufacturing for production and then start verifying everything on the way back up. This looks different. And this, this was developed specifically for the aerospace world. And here's the difference. Um, and this is the subject of a paper I gave last year at the SNAMI convention. If you look at what um, it takes to develop a ship versus to develop an aircraft, um, we typically use computer-aided engineering, we use small-scale models, and we don't ever develop full-scale prototypes. We never build a ship at full scale, test it, and then see what needs to be done before we start building it on a production basis. The first ship that we build is the prototype ship, and we keep building that. If you're in the air, aeronautics and aircraft industry, you're building full-scale prototypes. These are the full-scale prototypes of the F-35. Um, they get to actually build them, fly them, sometimes blow them up, which I think is so cool because we don't get a chance to blow up any of our ships until after they're decommissioned. And then we fly them off one against the other. So in the world of aircraft, systems engineering, and this is also true of cars, this is true of iPads, you're building many prototypes before you finally get to the production model. Well, this is not cheap. Let's look at the difference between two cargo carrying uh, vessels. Well, two cargo carrying platforms. A cargo lifter, C-17, carries cargo, doesn't have weapons. And a cargo ship, T-A-K-E. This is a Navy cargo ship. This is an Air Force cargo aircraft. The costs are, eh, you know, pretty much the same for production. What does it take to develop them? Here is a breakdown of the cost that it takes to develop a aircraft versus a ship. This is in thousands of dollars. So what you see here is the bottom line. It is about four to six billion with a B dollars to develop an aircraft before you start building it and about 140 million with an M dollars to develop a ship before you start building it. <coughs> it takes 50 times more money to go through this full systems engineering process, which includes one test aircraft and two um, test airframes to follow what aviation engineers call systems engineering. What we do in ship design is closer in its nature to how you build a skyscraper or how you build a bridge. There's no such thing as a prototype skyscraper. You build a skyscraper, you follow the rules, and it's up. Same with a ship. So that's the difference between systems engineering and ship engineering. We're closer in, um, to civil engineers, to people who build skyscrapers and, and bridges than we are to people who build aircraft. So Armin, did that answer your question? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, We're on time, Larry. Uh, in terms of the, the 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 
planned time, uh, but okay. students are welcome to uh, stay and ask questions. Larry, if you don't mind answering more questions. Uh, I, I do not mind. Okay. Um, and by the way, um, not, not to be too um, uh, obvious, I do believe that uh, the two books at the beginning um, are a good resource for students and professors. Uh, we've never had a history of our profession before. And so if you want to understand how we got to where we are today, um, this, is, this is where you're gonna find it. If you take uh, civil engineering, you learn about civil engineers of the past. If you take uh, aeronautics, you learned about the great um, aviation engineers. Um, this is where you're going to learn about the great naval architects and how we became um, the profession we are today. So there's my, um, both from MIT Press. And uh, by the way, uh, anybody who has ever published a uh, academic book knows you don't actually get any money from this. So no, I'm not, I'm not pitching this to, to, to make any, uh, any money. We don't get money. But um, I do, I always believed that uh, I was missing out on not knowing the history of my profession, which is why I wrote this, these two books. And I really want our future students and our professors to have this as a tool so they have a, a story to tell people. Yeah. Well, thank you, Larry. Yeah, it's too bad we can't have a book signing uh, event uh, with this. That would be so cool. Uh, but like, uh, if you Google it, uh, you can find it. You can find on Amazon, I assume. And uh, uh, I, I'm i planning on uh, that. So before I uh, sign off, uh, again, thank you, Larry, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, be here with us. And uh, it's very inspiring and uh, fascinating talk. Oh. Um, so thank everyone uh, and please feel free to stay on with more questions. Uh, well, for and, those who uh, have to leave, thank you. That, yeah, someone said that I found a PDF on my library too, on our library. So we okay. have a library uh, copy for this. Uh, Whichever way is, is easiest for you to read, please do. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. So next time when you come back, we'll have a book sign event. <laughs> oh, I, um, I it, it would be, it would, it would be wonderful. Um, I do hope there'll be uh, opportunities in the, uh, in the future. Um, I'm glad to hear that uh, students are able to take classes. Um, I, I had actually wondered how you're going to have uh, uh, doing your, your, um, the, the 300 hydrodynamics course in the, laboratory without uh, actually being present. So I'm glad, I'm glad at least some of the uh, instruction is live. Yeah, I mean, teach two courses uh, live. And uh, I saw that Yuling, uh, Yuling Pen is a new professor, a hydrodynamic new professor in the department. And uh, uh, Yuling oh, is- Well, welcome, uh, welcome. Hi, Larry. Hi. Hi, great talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, so I'm, you need I'm, I'm glad you did. Uh, yeah, I'm teaching a graduate student uh, class uh, and I have about half remote and half uh, in person. So, uh, but it's not easy. It's, uh, <laughs> so, so there's a lot of, uh, if you follow the news, there are a lot of, uh, uh, I do not know how you, how do you teach, because I've done this. Uh, are you teaching where some of the students are tuning in and you're in front of other students all at the same time? Or do you have two classes, two sections, one's remote and one's live? Uh, the same class, but it's recorded. So uh, wow. some people are, uh, you know, be there and some people are calling in uh, 
in sync, and some are just following the class in the, I mean, offline, asynchronized fashion. I, I feel your pain <laughs> because I've done that. And well, the, big, the, the biggest pain for me is to watch yourself and, uh, you know, and watch yourself make mistakes on, <laughs> online and you can't correct it. Right? Yes. It's a permanent record. <laughs> I've, I've always, I found it very difficult to try to switch my attention from people physically in front of me to people on the, online to see who's asking which questions. Yeah. And um, I think eventually the uh, school I was doing this for uh, was Stevens Institute. Um, we eventually just went either all live or all online, but, but uh, we decided not to go with hybrid. It, it just became too difficult to um, toggle between the two. So I, like I said, I feel your pain. Well, those are, you know, just the stream, like Zoom. So they, they, they are logging to the Zoom and you, right. you ask questions and you answer questions. Uh, right. But like also students say that, you know, some students can speak up, but others, feel like, oh, it will be recorded, right? So they kind of think twice, <laughs> want to make sure that the question asked was, uh, but I tell them that even as a professor, you know, <laughs> I, I, I just get to get thick faced, you know, <laughs> you, it's okay to make a mistake, you will make mistakes. And, uh, uh, but that's how we learn. So we get used to, I think that, that uh, we're getting into it. Good. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there's no other, you know, it doesn't sound like there's any other questions. So um, I know you guys have a busy day and uh, I will let uh, all of you go. Um, again, I was very happy to do this. I'll be happy to do it at, at any other time, um, either, you know, on per, in person or uh, um, on on uh, on screen uh if you if anybody has questions by the way they come to you uh don't hesitate to just forward them to me i'm happy to answer directly okay all right i have a quick question if i can yes sir uh, absolutely it's about the history uh i'm just wondering what is the role of uh, uh shipbuilding in china to the whole history because i read here and there that the uh, shipbuilding technology was very advanced once in the Ming Dynasty. And, it was. Uh, built uh, like Zhenghe uh, Charter Ship and, uh, right. and the fleet. So does that play any role in the development of the shipbuilding technology? It, it absolutely did. Um, the, um, the idea of the bulkhead, in fact, comes from uh, even before the Ming Dynasty. The um, I'm sorry, I just... Song Dynasty was, um, and if I'm not saying it correctly, please correct That's me. Right. <laughs> um, okay. But the Song Dynasty, um, we know from records that they were using um, bulkheads primarily as a way of uh, stiffening the ships as opposed to making them watertight uh, from one compartment to the next, but they did also serve that purpose. Um, it was the voyages of a few uh, Westerners to Siberia, um, primarily, and and the uh, and 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 having contact with China, where they brought the idea back to um, the Americas, and in fact, oh, sorry, to Europe, and then to the Americas. Benjamin Franklin mentions um, the idea of the bulkheads. And those first became used on a regular basis starting in about 1810, 1820. Um, one of the things that, uh, of course, happened with the Zheng He um, voyages that even in China, it's, it's not very well recognized. Mm -hmm. um, the Ming emperor did not stop ocean exploration after Zheng He. Zheng He did what he was supposed to do. Zheng He's job was to go out to all the different ports that China traded with, the Ming emperors traded with, stop 
the people who were trading illicitly because you needed to give tribute to the, to the emperor. That's what you did. If you were part of the trade, you had to give um, tribute. But there were a whole host of people who did not do this. Zheng He's job was to take these massive sailing vessels with cannon, um, didn't have very big cannon, but they had cannon. They were impressive. Crush the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the mercenaries, or as it were, the, 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 the people who weren't paying tribute, and then come home. And he did. And once they did that, they said, okay, you did your job. Thank you. We're done. And he stopped. So I, I know there's a wonderful myth that Sheng He was um, traveling the world and was opening up horizons, but it was uh, it was every bit as based upon where the where the potential riches were as the Europeans were. The Europeans were sending big ships around Africa to Asia because that's where the money was. I mean, if you think about Europe in the 1400s, it was dirt poor, it was full of disease, it was nothing, they had nothing. So they find this incredibly, incredibly well-to-do region with massive um, infrastructure development, and they say, we want some of that. Um, I tell you what confuses me. The um, the Europeans were bringing back luxury goods. They were bringing back porcelain. They were bringing back tea. They were bringing back all this wonderful stuff. I have no idea what they used to pay for it because the Europeans had lead. They had wool cloth. Who wants wool? I mean, it's it's a little bit hot in, in Southeastern Asia. Uh, so what are you doing with wool? Um, the short answer was they had to figure out how to get silver because what the Ming dynasty or the Ming emperors did was say, you know that wonderful paper currency that everybody was using for like 500 years? We're not doing that anymore. So they got rid of the paper currency, which was a brilliant idea, by the way. They said, we got to use silver. And at just about that time, the Spanish empire found silver in Mexico and Peru so the trade, which had been kind of lackluster because the Europeans had nothing to offer, suddenly they had silver. And when silver was found, most about a quarter of all the silver that was ever dug up out of the ground went to China. Sorry, Larry, I wish I could stay listening to this very interesting nope. discussion. But I had to sign off because I have to sign in another meeting. So thank okay. you again. Well, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. You're welcome. Bye. So, um, so anyways, there's there's way more than you were asking about. Yeah. <laughs> but I was uh, very interested in in the whole trade pattern. So um, I started looking into the silver trade, and that really was the engine that generated the world economy as we know it today. Um, so uh, now my two books, um, I did everything I could not. Uh, to ensure that I was able to include developments that were happening outside of Europe. But by the time book number two really um, winds down is when many of the really important developments, especially in China, were starting to ramp up, um, especially in computer-aided uh, computer design and uh, optimization. So I've said in my book, um, this is a job for the next historian who comes along. There's a huge story that's being written even as we speak. And um, I won't be able to cover it, not in nearly the depth that I'd like to, but there, there's, there's more to the story that has to be written. So I hope you know some people who will be willing to write that um, because we, we still need this story. Yeah. We, th this is how we communicate. We tell each other stories. Yes, yes. As naval architects, we really haven't had a story to tell. Now we have a story to tell. I agree. I will definitely take a look at these books, and I think they are very important. Uh, I, I do not have any story to tell. When <laughs> oh, yes, you do. You just don't know it yet. Right, right, right. Everybody does.
Yeah. Okay. Um, as uh, I don't want to keep people, um, uh, if you guys uh, don't mind, I think it's probably time for us to sign off.